Hi everybody, our guest today is Dr. Pawan Kumar Singh, an esteemed scholar who is currently the director of Indian Institute of Management, Trichy. Earlier, he was the director of Management Development Institute at Gurgaon. Before that, he was a professor of organizational behavior at Indian Institute of Management, Indore, where he taught a unique course. The title of the course was Behavioral Insights from Sanskrit Scriptures. He taught that course for more than a decade. He has taught in several universities, including Kanpur University, Ignau, and Niti in Mumbai. He has trained officers in the defense and administrative sectors. He has guided several research scholars. He has graduate degrees in economics and industrial relations. But today he is here to discuss his recent work, a book, a masterpiece, Management Sutras from Sanskrit Scriptures. Sir, delighted to have you. Welcome to this conversation. Thank you, Sri Ram Subramanian Ji. Thank you. Namaskar to all. As I was telling you earlier, remember the uh, Rigveda script, which says, Ano Badraha Kratavoyantu Viswataha. This book or this knowledge came to me from India. When a friend of mine said, I have to read this book, I asked him why. I have read uh, quite a few books on these topics. But upon reading this book, I must say, this is an extraordinary piece of work. This is a very unique book. Now, this is a question I have. See, one is to learn Vedas, then you have to understand the Vedas, then you have to synthesize them. Then on the other side of the equation, you have the knowledge of business and management. Now to juxtapose these two streams of knowledge and establish some kind of a contextual relationship between these two would take years and years for somebody. Please tell us your background. And here you are saying you were introduced to Vedas by your grandfather. Please tell us about how this book came about. I will begin by saying, by underlining the importance of either giving or receiving a gift at right time in your life. So when I was 15 years old, my grandfather gifted me two books. One, Ram Charit Manas, written in Devanagari, written by Sant Tulsi Das. And other book, what he gifted at the age of 15 was Bhagavad Gita. Now, Ram Charit Manas, at that point of time onward, I started reading, trying to understand, trying to understand from my grandfather himself and from other persons. But Bhagavad Gita waited for about 10 to 12 years, its pages to be turned on by me, because uh, first of all, Bhagavad Gita is in Sanskrit, and uh, it took time for me to actually grasp the rasa, the quintessence, the juice of Bhagavad Gita. So let me say, you have two or three questions in your let us say first introductory remark. First of all, Shastra, the scriptures, they are like uh, a fruit which is a bit hard on its outer shell. But once you go a little deeper, three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeter deeper, you start finding the juicy part. Like one sweet meat is Rasagulla, very famous in India. It is juicy outside, juicy inside. But unlike Rasagulla, the Shastra is like the fruit, what is called Bel, Bilva, Bel, or let us say even Guava. Guava is a little hard from outside. That's why you have to pursue the scriptures. You have to keep pursuing the scripture to allow its meaning to get revealed by itself. It has been said in Veda that it is richa of Veda. Richa of Veda means shloka of Veda or mantra of Veda or sutra of Veda. So it is sutra of Veda which itself decides that how much I have to reveal to a particular reader or a particular person who is interested in that uh, scripture. And that's why you have to keep pursuing it. You have to keep pursuing it. And as your face changes or with the change dress, your appearance changes before mirror. So as you become experienced, as much meaning, actually scriptures start revealing to it. Second point is that, that of course it takes longer time. But let us remember 
anything precious in life takes time. Uh, please don't misunderstand me, but uh, I'm giving you a thumb rule that uh, anything which comes instantaneous can leave you instantaneously. Anything which is invocated, what is called in Sanskrit, Ahwan. Ahwan means you pursue it. You say, please come, please come and stay with me. That's why Shravan Manana Nidhyasana. Shravan means either reading or listening. Let us say in broader context. Manan means churning inside. And Nidhyasana means establishing permanently the acquired knowledge within. Because the knowledge of Shastra, it has a typical characteristics I found. It is volatile. Once it comes to you and you don't try to have it, Nidhyasana, establishing within, it will evaporate. So it takes time. Suddenly you said it took uh, about a decade, more than a decade to actually give shape to this book. But before that, long back the journey had started. I, I think I should stop here so that we can have more round of dialogues. Thank you. Yes. So, you know, in, in your book, the first thing is I read this book completely. You know, this is no doubt a masterpiece. Um, you are talking about, for instance, Jnanam Nyeyam Parijnada Travida Karma Chodhana and then other statement is in the 18th chapter in Bhagavad Gita, it says Jnanam Karma Cha Karta Cha Tridaiva Muna Vedana and then goes to talk about uh, Sattvic, Tamasic and uh, uh, Rajasic archetypes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that because I have a question pertaining to that in the management side. Mm -hmm. Please explain these three archetypes. That's fine. Just before going to that, I just give a quickly within two sentences, broad framework. The methodology of compilation of this management sutra from Sanskrit scripture has been very simple, but very arduous. Uh, there was no pre-plan that how this book will take shape because I was searching uh, a meaning that uh, when I teach in, let us say, National Institute or Indian Institute of Management, what is Indian in this education? So that actually kept me pushing or pulling. There was more pulling rather than pushing. Nobody was pushing me to do this work. Something was pulling. So I do not claim that I have understood Shastra. No claim, please. But yes, with God's grace, my eyes have passed through more than 40 Sanskrit Shastras. And when I say 40, 191 Upanishads, which I consulted, I count as one because all 191 Upanishads as a set is one, that is Upanishad. So thousands and thousands of pages of uh, original Sanskrit with either Hindi or English meaning I kept on reading. And this itself uh, actually took about uh, equivalent to a time um, which anybody takes to complete a, a, an engineering degree or so, four years, five years. So that time this book was actually not in my vision. Uh, that was time to crystallize ideas. Then I started teaching elective courses in National Institute of Industrial Engineering, Mumbai, and then in Indian Institute of Management, Indore. Uh, and then I am continuing here at uh, Indian Institute of Management, Tilsha Palli also. Uh, then it started taking shape. About 2000 sutras have been compiled. They are all spontaneous. But because I have background of management and economics, these all sutras, at one point of time, I found that keeping my mind active from managerial angle, if I again read those shastra, I will start identifying which sutra actually fits to which kind of dialogue which we do in the field of management or economics or business or in mundane affairs for life management. So 210 topics emerged and about 2000 sutras are compiled here. Now, coming to that uh, issue that you raised, that uh, Sattvic, Rasik, Tamsik, and 18th chapter, uh, that uh, sutra that you said, that uh, Karta, Karm, all these. I would like to say, you see, this being, this being can operate either at lower level or higher level. It depends on at which level of consciousness we are operating. There is an interesting question raised by Mata Parvati to Lord Shiv and she asks the consort, the Mahaguru Shiv, that please tell me who is wise and who is unwise. 
and Lord Shiv gives a reply that is unparalleled. He says that, dear, nobody is wise in this world and nobody is unwise in this world. When a person actually is guided by wisdom, at that point of time, he or she is wise. But when unwiseness creates eclipse on your wisdom, at that point of time, you become unwise. So nobody is confirmed wise. Nobody is confirmed unwise. At which point you are wise, then you are wise. At other point you are unwise, you are unwise. So this sattvic and asasic tamasic tendency, they indicate that these trigunatmak, these three characteristics we all possess and all three are needed. Actually, sattvic is more praised and tamasic is more condemned in literature. It does not mean that we do not need tamasic tendency. Sometimes I must feel, let me stop doing the work and let me go to sleep. That is also tamasic. If I'm fully occupied by rajasic tendency, I will be victim of sleeplessness. So some degree and a thumb, thumb rule formula, which I suggest that in your life, you see 45% of your characteristics should be sattvic, 40% rajasic, and then remaining 15% tamasic. Now, why 45 and 40, why 40 to sattvic and 40 to rajasic? And when we say we have to become um, uh, leader or manager with fire in belly and we have to become dynamic manager, why rajasic should be only 40%? My argument is that 40% rajasic is enough for you to become the most dynamic person in this world. But it has to be supervised by a little more potent sattvic. Under the supervision of 40% sattvic, if 40% rajasic is, is, is working, still you are fully dynamic, but actually you are dynamic in auspicious way. Your dynamism will not take you to inauspicious lane. And 15% tamasic is needed because sometimes you should also say enough is enough. Let me close my work today. Let me go to sleep. Let me take rest. Let me just take some, let us say, uh, some slumber. So 15% tamasic also may be needed. So my formula is 45, 40, 15 for sattvic, rajasic, tamasic respectively. And regarding that uh, karta and karm, I would like to say, uh, those who have read the basic of Hindi grammar, it is said karta ne, karam ko, karan se, and so on. So karta means the person, doer. Of course, Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures say that be free from doership. But still, let us say at mundane level of consciousness, ordinary level of consciousness, if I am doing, I am a doer. Uh, just for the sake of, let us say, uh, explanation or simplicity, the person who is doing is a doer. Of course, I have to get rid of doership tendency. That is a different issue. And what is being done is the karam. Now, when karta basically does it with the bhava, with the feeling of only being an instrument, that is karan. Karta ne karam ko karan se. So when karta becomes karan, the karam becomes auspicious. And when karta is get filled of, let us say, doership, I am doing. So when I say I am doing, I gets underlined, M gets understated, and doing becomes, let us say, uh, semi-optimal. When I becomes diluted, and M means M A M M means my existence only remains, I-ness goes away, then doing becomes auspicious. Well, I mean, you see, uh, your scholarship became very evident just now because I was about to ask you a question and you already answered it. My question was about how much of sattvic, tamasic and rajasic should one have now that these three archetypes have been defined in Bhagavad Gita. I guess you sense my mind and you answered that question already. And in your, in your answer, you brought this word, what is Indian in Indian Jews of management? Okay. And I have been wondering this also for some time because the professors in IIMs and so many universities in India, they often quote and cite Western thinkers, be it Burton Russell or Thomas Paine or anybody like that, but seldom they quote and cite scriptures uh, from Bhagavad Gita or from Ramayana or any such things. Why do you think that is? You see, 
going to the root is always difficult if you take philosophers like uh, uh, spinoza or uh, max muller german scholar uh, or let us say uh, schopenhauer they all actually became mad mad means divana they they became excited intoxicated when they saw our uh, roots of the literature and you tell me that uh, when upanishad was developing and some upanishads are very old some are new also there are two types of upanishads vedic upanishad non vedic upanishad they can be easily identified because vedic upanishads they start with invocation uh, rig vedic upanishad or yajur vedic upanishad krishna yajurveda and uh, shukla yajurveda athar veda sam veda so these all scriptures one has to invest time to go to the root for example for an ordinary person like me would also would, would always prefer to go to the original piece of scripture rather reading interpretation of somebody else at the first instance i would like to read 100 interpretations on any book but out of 100 if you say these are the 10 best seller books in the world best seller and interpretation of a scripture i'll say please give me first the original i would like to see the simple meaning first i'll create a base like a farmer creates a base first farmer plows the field and creates the base then only does a seed or fertilizer or irrigation helps but field has to be prepared in 13th chapter also kshetra kshetra ke vibhag yog bhagavad gita says kshetra to bane pehle first of all field should be ready so original should be studied first and reading original takes time because out of these 40 scriptures which i actually consulted one is set of 191 upanishads so one can imagine the voluminous let us say uh, uh, set of 40 scriptures when one has 191 books similarly mahabharat is counted as one in my 40 scheme of things but mahabharat has 1 lakh 300 shlokas and if you steal time from your so called busy life and if you read for 2 to 2 and 1/2 hours daily mahabharata it will take around 11 to 12 months to complete that reading only and after reading also you cannot claim you have understood only you have read but that will take that much time and that's why what happens we take easy route because somebody from other place has actually appreciated so it must be worth appreciating and then i also get rid of going to the original because original requires investment and in that investment what happens during investment you may not get anything because the scripture itself from outer its outer core is not so attractive actually scriptures by design they say hey if you are lost in the world please keep enjoying the lower self of consciousness or lower consciousness please don't come to me but then when you pursue and you say hey don't misguide me allow me to come to you then it is time taking endeavor that's why for two reasons we quote let us say uh, of course quoting any any scholar from any corner of the world is, is, is nothing wrong there but without going to original when we start quoting for two reasons that if something is coming from others it must be uh, it must be let us say precious and secondly um, i find a way to have a shortcut to knowledge whereas there is no shortcut to knowledge you have to put your continuous endeavor to it that's why it is said rasri yavat jadate shilpar padat nishan you see the, the the rope which is rubbing the hard stone at a well and then after years you find there is a mark of that rubbing of the rope but rope is softer rock is harder and if rope rubs the stone for lesser time there will, will not be any mark on the stone but if rope keeps rubbing the stone for longer time then there is mark that's why reading scripture is not like 2020 match it is like a test match it is like a marathon race it is a lifetime investment and that's why perhaps for two reasons we find shortcut and we find that if somebody has said it must be more precious and because we have lost some sense of originality Uh, and and we feel that if somebody has put at a station on your work then only it is precious uh, yeah very, very true what, what you said is absolutely true then we have on the other side the student's interest 
Now, how do we make sure that the students, our students in India, cultivate some kind of an interest towards understanding these scriptures? Because they are looking around the world and then thinking that to be an expert, to be a leader one day, to be the CEO of a global conglomerate, I have to be more proficient in uh, what is said in literatures in probably English and German and those kind of things rather than on Sanskrit. So how do we tell or convey this information to the students that, yeah, those are important, but you have to understand the basics of what is said in the Sanskrit scriptures because that is what is going to propel you into leadership positions. How do we convince the students of that? Fine. Let us say in this whole scheme of thing that you're describing, there are three role players. One is, of course, the scriptures, the book, whatever book, let us say for you, if you are teaching materials management, uh, the book, the source of knowledge, the journal, the article. So one source is source of knowledge. Second is a student, set of students, set of participants. And third one is the facilitator, the faculty, the professor, the teacher or the trainer. In this triangle, let us say, three vertices are there. The source of knowledge is students and teacher. Now, source of knowledge, its profundity is ensured. So no discussion on that. If students, they will get attracted or not, it depends on two things. Number one, the sanskara of a student himself or herself. But secondly, also, the, the conviction, the depth of the teacher, even if let us say an ordinary MBA student or any student of business or any student of chemistry or botany or zoology, if at first instance not attracted towards Sastra, it depends on the profundity, depth and conviction of the teacher. So first of all, teachers must prepare himself or herself or the system must allow teacher to get prepared like that. And that's why you see, when Upanishad was being discussed with the students, with the receivers, the guru used to sit at the highest level of experience. The guru was not only parroting away or memorizing the lines, but he was living. And that's why it has been said, Rishyo Mantra Drashta, it means those who have written Veda or Upanishad, they did not know only the meaning of mantra. They used to see the mantra. Mantra ko dekhne wale ko rishi kehte the. Because rishi itself comes from a basic root word pashanti or pash. It means to be able to see. If you are able to see the mantra, if you are able to see the truth, actually you know the truth. And that's why here the role of the teacher is very, very important. And let me say, scriptures are not here to take you away from your mundane dynamism. If you want to be dynamic in mundane affairs, it will make you more dynamic, but with a touch of sattvic bhava. I will tell you. One question was asked to me that you talk about Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, it will take uh, the, let us say, tenacity of managers away from their main business. <laughs> I said, who told you? You see, there is no ranking of Upanishad or there is no, let us say, order. But in general, when you see the books on Upanishad, the first Upanishad listed would be Isha Vashya Upanishad. And Isha Vashya Upanishad, its first sutra only says that please live in this world with full enthusiasm and enjoy the things around. It says, Isha Vashya Midam Sarvam. And then it says the second line, First line says that this world is full of godliness and God's power. But then it says in the second line, Tena tena bhunjitha. Bhunjitha means bhunjan, means eat. Eat means consume. If I'm watching a TV in Sanskrit, I'm also eating that. If I'm eating bread, that is also eating. If I'm reading a book, that is also bhunjitha, that is eating only. So what Upanishad says? Tena bhunjitha means whatever material are available around you, please consume it, enjoy it. Upanishad does not say don't enjoy, run away, close your eyes or enjoy your eyes so that you are not able to see the beautiful things. It says, ten these all to be consumed. But there's a rider, Chaktain, 
it means that detached bhava i may have the best sofa in my drawing room but why it is it is to give comfort to any guest who visits but i should not have a feeling i have the best sofa in my locality you may have the best pen in your pocket but why the, uh, it gives me joy if i can afford to purchase a very costly pen no problem and i should purchase just to pretend that i am a man of simplicity even if you like to purchase a pen you should not purchase that that at least i would not like to recommend purchase a pen but then think that this pen with god's grace i could purchase and i will enjoy writing this but don't think that i have the best pen, pen among all my friends then that thing will be so nowhere shastra says that please dilute your tenacity for worldly achievements it says just be here but be like lotus in the mud but be there lotus never says hey i want to run away from mud and even if let us say a typical tyagi purush will say that the world is quite mirish it is full of attraction mud it creates entanglement but this is the this is the test this is the examination hall and please remember that when god is more merciful on you he or she whatever form be pay god either mother form or father form god will set tougher question paper for you so tougher question paper if god sets it means god wants that you should develop more and more and you see what happens in this world mundane world we are into the scheme of decision making Uh, we want to uh, come out of the cloud of confusion uh, the, the 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 foggy area of confusion and we want to have a clear decision isn't it we want that and in one narak parivraja upanishad one rishi prays to the god very surprising things are there you see upanishad and scriptures are not interested in your incremental development they are only interested in your transcendental development and that's why in narak parivraja upanishad one rishi is praying to the god and saying oh god are you annoyed with me you have not given me high quality confusion for long time do you want me to end up with that same level of consciousness where i am actually dwindling now no no please give me high quality of confusion so that when i resolve that i acquire high level of consciousness so many worldly things have been talked in this in, in this scripture A scripture is not against you living in this world and excelling in this world but it says excel in the world with a touch that is the only point the scripture is saying yeah and and i i guess he is asking for more challenges he saying yes, yes challenges bring out the best in me so give me more challenges don't yes, give me here yes. and another thing i noticed is uh, it looks like some of what is said here are applicable under multiple uh, situations in the management and business environments for instance one uh, shloka you have from bhagavad gita which says sidanti mama gatrani mukancha parisushyadi where arjuna says oh you know i am sweating all over and you classified it under communication and i have said this in the class more under uh, indecisive in nature especially when crucial decisions have to be made some people buckle under pressure and they are not able to make decisions so here is one situation viewed by you in one way you viewed as the lack of communication skills and i viewed as the lack of decision making skills so given a situation if one can derive multiple lessons what does it say about the scriptures well uh one sutra let us say uh, in, in this uh, management sutra from sanskrit scriptures if one sutra is compiled under one topic it should not limit a worthy reader to use that sutra only under the context of that topic sidanti mam gatrani mukhani parishushyati i compiled it under communication topic because i have found when i was uh, at the end of my teen age 21 22 23 at that time uh, we started facing interviews and i always enjoyed facing interview i was i i used to be excited to go to the interview hall interview room to meet new persons and have some engagement 
And actually, here it is, let us say, out of track, but you have not asked this question. But whenever I entered interview room, I auto suggested myself. If I am selected, it is good. If they do not select me, it is better because they are leaving me for wider world <laughs> to explore further things. And that used to give me boost of self-confidence because I was not worried during interview that I must get this job. If you give this job, it is good. If you reject me, it is better. That gives you confidence. I used to find that better built students or candidates than me, equally qualified as I am, they used to come out of the interview hall having sweat on their forehead, nervous, all these things. Perhaps something might be working in my mind. I put under communication. But please remember that what you are saying, what I am saying, you want, if you, if you would have been given a chance, you would have perhaps compiled under decision making. I compiled under communication. But actually, what is communication? Communication is the outer manifestation of your decision. Actually, your decision and communication all are interconnected. Unless I am a confirmed pretender. <laughs> Yes, yes. And, and uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, um, nowadays, CEOs and leaders make decisions based on quarterly earnings. Their focus is more short term. What do scriptures say about making long term decisions or considering things on a long term basis rather than for short term profits and short term benefits? Do you have uh, explanations from scriptures that will help people guide when to make or when to focus on short term, when to focus on long term? Fine. It is a very precious question for uh, benefit of a larger audience also. Uh, you see, if short term gain is not in conflict with long term gain, then let us also enjoy short term gain and long term gain. If short-term gain and long-term gain are in conflict with each other, it means one has to be sacrificed for the another. It means if you enjoy the short-term gain, long-term gain will not be there. Or if you want to have the last laugh, short-term gain may not be there or visible gain may not be there. In this context, I'll say dilemma arises when these two are basically in, in, in uh, let us say, substitutable mode. What to sacrifice for what? The scriptures clearly say that you must sacrifice your short-term gain for long-term gain. It means you must be prepared for the last laugh because that thing is well, which ends well. And if at the end you are laughing, your laughing means you're enjoying, you're smiling. That is better. Or during the first phase of journey, you smile, you laugh. At the end of the journey, you are crying then suddenly you are at loss and the scriptures give very precious suggestions at many places in many scriptures it is there i'll just bring here one example which is simpler but one of the most profound way of deciding what is desirable decision and what is inauspicious decision i take uh, shelter of kathopanishad and in kathopanishad dharmaraj is saying to nachiketa that there are two types of decisions and one is prayers, one is shreyas. These two words are in Kathopanishad. I will underline and re-emphasize. I may say with my louder voice that if every citizen of the world remembers these two words, the world will become more beautiful. Which are these two words? Shreyas and prayers. Or prayers and shreyas. Just two words. It will help anybody to take better decision. Prayers means, in Sanskrit, prayers means priya lagna. It means what is creating entanglement, invitation for quick gain. What is attractive in the beginning, but last result is bitter. These all decisions are prayers decisions. And Shreya's decisions are those decisions. Shreya means Shrestha, superior quality, good quality, auspicious. These Shreya's decisions may be sweeter in beginning, 
and also suddenly shreyas will be sweeter in end also but most of the time shreyas is bit bitter in the beginning and sweeter at the end these are the words from upanishad now i give my example in my own way prayers that is sweeter in short run and bitter in long run is like that house which has got a beautiful drawing room but living room is like hell people are living in hell but they have decorated their, their drawing rooms with the most precious things of the world but shreyas shrestha decision superior quality thinking and decisions they are like that house its drawing room is ordinary not necessarily ordinary it may be also beautiful but it may be ordinary also but living room is like heaven there the dwellers live like being in heaven they eat together they laugh together if life paints different color they cry together they find let us say strength from one another so the scripture said that if there is conflict between short term gain and long term gain without rider always sacrifice short term gain for long term gain because that is the path of auspiciousness that is the path of shreyas so in this life we should try to maximize maximize the shreyas and minimize and if possible completely annihilate the prayers <laughs> yeah i i hope uh, management students take this important lesson from you because we li- live in a world where investors look for short term returns you saying don't worry about these long term returns focus on the short term returns so an entrepreneur or a corporate executive may be pressured by investors to focus on short term and which is where uh, they may have to decide whether they are going to sacrifice long term happiness for short term happiness uh, i i hope uh, they take lessons from these scriptures uh, in making complex decisions now one last question for you so my mother tongue is tamil and i am a admirer of thiruvalluvar and i uh, try to quote him as much as i can and he has made my life uh, very easy so mm. how did you are interested in thirukural come about yes um, thirukural actually uh, hindi poetic intended translation of my book hindi poetic translation of uh, thirukural was published last year and by chance it just happened i joined the indian school of management tiruchirappalli and after 15 days the book was published and somebody said me where are you preparing to come to tamil nadu <laughs> i said no it, it was not like that it was god's let us say mercy and grace in 2000 in the year 2000 133 feet tall statue of tiruvalluvar saint Tiru, tiruvalluvar was actually uh, established in kanyakumari 2000 just after one year 2001 my father mother all visited there i did not accompany them so my father got mesmerized by watching the statue of thiru valluvar ji and he started uh, he had heard the name but not much idea he started taking interest and after 8 or 9 years in 2008 or 9 in 2001 he visited kanyakumari in 2008 and 9 he started trying to make hindi translation poetic hindi translation of the kurals of tirukkural once in summer vacation i visited him where he was living in baidnath dham in devgarh i find he gets engaged in diary for about 1 hour every day and i asked what you are doing he said i am just doing something which gives me solace and joy then i found his meter was not correct means uh, let us say out of uh, 1330 kurals uh, he had already translated 700 but out of 700 only meter of 50 were more joyful or juicy others were just uh, doing something but how he was doing he did not know tamil so he had purchased one english translation of tirukkural so english verse of every kural was there so he would understand the english and would translate in hindi then i said give me this work he said no no you will spoil the work because you are otherwise busy person you teach business management you can't do it 
<laughs> let me do it is my just uh, a very good let us say my 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 uh, it is it is a food for my uh, soul but then i snatched the work from him worked for some time then work got halted for 3 4 years continuously but anyway let, let us uh, cut this story short then i started translating because i took a deep interest and i found a deep interest was developing automatically so methodology was original tirukkural and eight english translations i purchased because i also do not know tamil except few words like soru moru tanni and appalam food i told you yes yes konjam konjam so mm. these eight books english translations they became my bridge but why eight why not one or two or why not nine because eight i could get high quality books and then i used to find common factor after reading one kural eight english translations if common factors are clearly emerging it means meaning must be this that my mind noted but if even after eight english translation of a particular kural if i was confused my other eight or 10 tamil friends were always available i used to talk on telephone or i used to meet they would say me something once they say i'll try to imbibe and then convert it to poetic meter and uh, uh, that i can do with some ease Uh, so this was the methodology and it is actually a work of uh, duo d u o duo father and son pair <laughs> yeah but i mean it's it's uh, probably you have a very unique life you were introduced to vedas by your grandfather and you had an opportunity to work with your father to translate tirukkural into hindi mm. seldom people get such uh, opportunities to work with uh, ancestors uh and and you know you made an important statement i never uh, visualized tirukkural that way you said it is a food for the soul uh, there is no better way of describing uh, that literature it is uh, definitely a food for the soul mm -hmm. and it is so encouraging to see uh, someone like you taking interest in tirukkural and translating not in ordinary hindi but in poetry hindi mm -hmm. uh and what has been the review from people who have read that book uh, in north india about tirukkural do you think it has given people an insight of what tirukkural is all about yes uh, some persons have purchased uh, and uh, i got some feedback of course uh, this book uh, came when uh, period was at its peak and that's why publisher also said that uh, in limited way he is able to sell it out anyway uh, marketing is his job means publisher's job but what people said that it is it is uh, i i gave a i used to give a friendly random challenge uh, to my friends who are deeper into tirukkural those who know tamil and those who know hindi also then i used to say choose any digit between 1 and 1330 because these are the number of kurals say any number that particular verse i will tell you from my book and see the tamil version and you know tamil and please see the exactness has come or not then uh, i got encouraging feedback that yes this is the, uh, this is what is possible exact translation can be there let me say that nobody in this world can translate tirukkural it can be only intended translation because tiruvalluvar wrote every kural in seven words only so no claim that translation has happened or anywhere in any english translation i read it is not translation it is humble intended translation so uh, to summarize i would say that uh, randomly when i used to say give me any number see that kural challenge this kural and uh, they said that no meaning is coming clear so that way some encouragement is happening <laughs> yeah i came to this conversation uh, assuming that you are a scholar now you, you are more than a scholar <laughs> it's not like that i am very ordinary student i know nothing it seems sometimes <laughs> well you are you are scholarly and humble too so thanks for taking the time to explain to me